Bonjour à, à toutes et à tous. Les meilleures choses ont une fin. C'est déjà la quatrième conférence, quatrième et dernière conférence. Et donc, euh, euh, profitez bien de cette dernière conférence euh, qui sera consacrée aux managers at work. Et je donne tout de suite la parole à, à Roger. Thank you. In the previous lecture, I tried to provide a somewhat systematic survey of how managers are identified in our documents and some of the significance of their titles. I also tried to see how one might at times identify managers who bear no title at all in the surviving texts. <clears throat> in the course of this discussion, I expressed skepticism that the use of slaves as legal representatives achieved any real place in Egyptian society. <clears throat> Rather, I suggested that terms like idios and paidarion might instead best be seen as indications of function and relationship. As an antidote to the categorization of that lecture, I turn now to look in more granular fashion at some particular cases and ask just how far the kind of education that I discussed in the second lecture <coughs> actually affected the workings of managers. I begin with a case in which we do not have an archive concerning an estate, nor yet an informative large account, the two types of sources that normally are most helpful in identifying and studying managers. But by way of compensation, it provides an interesting glimpse at how private and public management might coexist in the affairs of a single family, and how a rather minimalist approach to the management of dispersed holdings could function. <clears throat> This case is that of the family of Apollonius and Serenilla, who lived in Arsinoe, but held Antinoite citizen status. They had two children of whom we know, a son Zoolos and a daughter Ptolema. Ptolema married a man named Johannes, presumably a Christian, and had a son named Serenus. We know about this family because they had connections with Aurelius Isidorus, son of Ptolemaios of Caranis, the eponym of that important archive. The presence of 15 documents concerning this relationship <clears throat> led me to write an article about them some years ago. The family owned about 48 Aruras in and around Karanis, and we imagine they had held holdings elsewhere, but we know nothing about them. The relevant documents extend from 296 to 315. In the earliest of these, Apollonius and Serenilla's son Zoolos is already managing property. Isidorus applies to lease 10 Aruras in three parcels in the Horiodictia, the area around Caranis, at a rent that would barely have covered the taxes, two artibas per Arura. Zoolos is described as Prutanico caexegetico huperete caihos crematidze an assistant to the Pritonus and Exegetes, and however he styles himself. Despite being personally wealthy and of Antinoite status, from a family presumably belonging to the original 6,475 Greek settlers of the Arsinoite gnome, Zoolos is working as a Huperetes. It is not surprising that he is literate. He signs the application approving the lease to Isidorus. Given that Zoolos' parents were still alive, it is not evident if he in fact owned the land that Isidorus attributes to him, or if he was simply managing family property for his parents. That was probably not of any significance in this context. That's the text in question.
The relationship between Zoloss and Isidorus was, if not already in 296, by some time in the next decade, not only one of landlord and tenant. In P. Cairo, Isidore 135, written on the back of an unpublished document dated to June 306, Zoloss writes to Isidorus with instructions to give Peus three artibus of wheat from what you have of mine and to send someone up to him in the city. And then ends, for the rest, until I come, and it breaks off. But the handwriting of this letter is, although well-formed and fluent, entirely different from Zoolos' supposed signature in P. Chir Isidore 99. Different styles for different contexts, or is Zoolos using a secretary in one of them? Isidorus was thus acting as an agent of Zoolos, maintaining a store of wheat belonging to the latter and carrying out instructions from him. Now Isidorus was, as he tells us often, not literate, so he can hardly be seen as a professional manager capable of keeping accounts by himself. But his function obviously bore some of the marks of management. And after all, if Petaus could be the village secretary of Ptolemaeus Hormu while being barely able to practice his signature, one could exercise managerial functions without a literate education. Isidorus also had a connection with Zoolos' sister, Ptolema, as we see in rent receipts, uh, which I will show you in a moment. Uh, in these, she is represented by her husband, Aurelius Johannes, gymnasiarch or perhaps former gymnasiarch. Johannes, according to his statement, wrote the entirety of these receipts. The hand is indeed the same in both of these receipts, a rapid, fluent, but somewhat awkward cursive. It is perhaps what one might expect from an upper-class male who had to do a lot of writing himself. As there is no evidence that Apollonius or Zoolos held one of the civic archai themselves, it would appear that Ptolema made a socially advantageous marriage, advancing to a class that her brother served as a huperetes. Ptolema's son Serenus represents her in two further rent receipts, in which he does not write the body of the receipts only, but, but only signs for his mother whom he describes as agramatos. Whereas the bodies of these two receipts are written in a professional cursive hand, Serenus's signature is clumsier. It is not obvious whether this represents a decline in education from one generation to the next, or if Serenus was perhaps still quite young and learning to write. We do not have the ages of any of the family members but we may guess that Apollonius and Serenilla were born around 250 to 260, Zoolos in, and Ptolema in the 270s or 280s, and Serenus around the beginning of the fourth century. So he could well have been a teenager. In this little dossier then, we can see the scale running from the civic elite of Arsinoe down to the propertied elite of Caranis with all levels exercising some degree of management of property. There is no sign here of a professional frontistes. That might mean only that the Caranese area holdings were not sufficiently consolidated to make such a person necessary. The family could handle on their own the leasing involved by relying on local agent for many things that a manager would do even if neither writing contracts nor keeping accounts was among those tasks. Naturally, we cannot say if the pattern was the same for the family's holdings elsewhere. And we do not know who actually wrote the documents in which no one takes responsibility for the body of the text. 
We cannot exclude the possibility that in fact some such manager was employed. If so, however, he is never the stated intermediary and he never raises his head for identification. I want to say, by the way, <coughs> that I owe the ability to show those images uh, largely to the kindness of Brendan Haug, uh, who got scans made for me of otherwise unavailable photos in the Bentley Library at the University of Michigan during the pandemic at that. <coughs> I turn now to two cases in which it is from large accounts that we have our information about a manager. The first is the well-known account, which I mentioned in the previous lecture, of the estate of Epimachus in the Hermopolite Nome, kept by Didymus, son of Aspasius, which occupies several roles on the verso of which is the constitution of Athens. <coughs> Didymus managed a central chorion, that is to say, vineyard and orchard, of which we do not know the size together with at least 10 more scattered plots, amounting to perhaps 40 auroras or somewhat more. Whether Epimachus had other holdings for which Didymus was not responsible, we do not know. No document gives us a title for Didymus, but he describes the properties at stake in the account as Keridzomena by him. So he might have been a Keristase. Dennis Kehoe describes a, quote, complex array of arrangements, unquote, used in managing the property, with both leasing and partnerships found. The Corion itself was directly managed with a limited number of permanent staff under a foreman named Ambrion, a remarkably rare name, otherwise attested in Egypt only in a number of tax receipts on Ostraca and a couple of papyri, as well as the patronymic of a Cretan, who left a proscunema at the Paneon of El Canais. All of this in the Hellenistic period. And the estate also had temporary labor hired as needed. Animals were handled similarly. The accounts are essentially consolidated day books. They involve neither much abstraction nor any analysis. Whatever higher level management was involved probably lived elsewhere <coughs> with Epimachus. We have no information on where these roles were found. Already Kenyon's first edition is silent on the matter of provenance. Some years ago, I raised the question of whose were the several hands that wrote the copy of the Constitution of Athens. They are less attractive than Didymus's bookkeeping hand, although that does rapidly become less formal than it is at the outset of the account. The plurality of writers in the Constitution may make it more likely that the copying of the text was done in Hermopolis by copyists available to Epimachus. At any rate, you can see from this that Didymus's own hand is a pretty good one on the whole. The writers of the Constitution were not professional book copyists. The hands are documentary in character. Perhaps Epimachus had a central estate staff of whom we know nothing otherwise, who could in their off hours keep their employer or master supplied with inexpensive texts of classical authors of interest to him using roles of which the necessary information had already been consolidated into summary ledgers. But one imagines that Didymus kept a copy in any case. Another case where we are dependent on a single account, but with very different results, is the Kellis Agricultural Account Book, a wooden codex dating to the 360s and coming from the Dakhla Oasis. The I, the ego, of this account, whose name we never learn, speaks of Adelphoi, colleagues, as pronoeti, 
and this was no doubt his title too. He had somewhere between three and six of these, all evidently within the same oasis. The owner, however, was a man named Faustianus, son of Aquila, who was based at Hibis in the Karga oasis, the other part of the ancient great oasis and a four-day journey away across the desert. The accounts are fairly simple journals of receipts and disbursements, but the pronoetes entered first each tenant's total amount due in each commodity, then entered installment payments toward that amount as they were made. He provided accounts for payments in the various commodities as well, with for the most part fairly laconic indications of the recipient or purpose. There is no indication of what he did with his surplus, which consisted entirely of high value crops such as olives, dates, and cotton. I have argued elsewhere that these were exported to the valley. The handwriting is a rapid cursive scroll, not very attractive, but very fluent. As was evident for the, from the outset, to Klaus Vorp and me anyway, the hand bears a marked resemblance to the first hand in the Kellis Isocrates Codex, which was found together with it. This codex seems, because of its marginal notations, as well as the use of wooden boards, most likely to have belonged to a teacher. It is not at all inconceivable that the Pronoetes doubled as a local teacher of Greek letters. And we have considerable evidence for the presence of a school at Kellis, as Raffaele Cribiore has pointed out, perhaps comparable to that found at Tremethys, to which we will come shortly. We do not know if this Pronoetes reported directly to the owner in Hippus, and to the mistress of the household, Oiko Despoina, presumably Faustianus' wife, or if there was any intermediate structure. He does not tell us <coughs> to whom he had to report his income and expenses. It would not be completely surprising if there were such an Epitropos figure, but if so, that person is obscured by the nature of the evidence. No such person is ever mentioned in the account. Somewhat curiously, but perhaps not entirely by chance, the excavations at Amheda, also in Dakhla, have brought to light what could be the missing piece in this picture, or at least somebody comparable to the missing piece. <coughs> this is the person of Serenus, the principal figure of the ostraca found in House One at Amheda, ancient Trimethus, and presumably its owner. From one of the letters found there, we gain the insight that he must have been a counselor, as he speaks of himself as having written a psathisma, a decree. He had a sizable house in the center of town with elaborate wall paintings, including in the main reception room, a number of mythological scenes. Adjacent to his house and sharing a party wall was a school in which Greek letters and rhetorical verse were taught. A note in Serenus's hand and signed by him, which we would date to the 350s or 360s, records the sending of 10 bundles of hay, topatri Faustiano, to his father Faustianus. As is normally the case, father is evidently here <coughs> to be taken not in a familial sense, but as a business relationship. The next line says, to the Hibite, Tohibite, with another five bundles. Faustianus is a very uncommon name, and we think it likely that this is the same as the owner of the property that the precisely contemporary Kellis account book concerns. Was it Serenus, his Epitropos, in the Dakla Oasis? His handwriting, as analyzed by Rodney Ast, is not so terribly different from that of the Pronoetes of the account book. 
at any rate, Serenus reminds us of Olypius and other figures of Bulautic status who functioned as high-level managers for owners of still higher status and wealth. It is worth noting as well that the circle of people with whom Serenus exchanges letters is almost entirely made up of men with Greek names. One of these, named Philippos, appears in another Austrican supplying a book of tablets, signed for by yet another member of the inner circle named Nicocles. At a minimum, one can surely say that Nicocles's father is likely to have read in school precisely the same orations of Isocrates that figure in the Kellis Codex, which includes the Nicocles and the odd Nicoclem. The number of literate people surrounding Serenus seems to have been considerable, and he himself did at least a large part of the routine writing connected with his activities, including innumerable boring receipts for hay and barley. <coughs> As Ost remarks, we have at least 24 texts certainly in Serenus's hand, which is a larger sample than we have for all but a handful of ancient individuals. Despite his high status then, Serenus was also a manager. <clears throat> in this remote location, we find the same pattern as in the Fayum, with managers at multiple levels coming from literate backgrounds of variable wealth commensurate with their level of responsibility. Lucius Belenus Gemellus is another individual from whom we have a large number of examples of writing, about the same number as for Serenus, in fact although on papyrus and much longer samples. Camellus was a veteran of the Roman army, probably born around AD 32 and retiring around 80. Settled in the village of Aphrodites Berenikes with four sons and a daughter. One of these sons, Sabinus, <coughs> plays a large role in the documents. The holdings for which Epagathus was manager were spread around Euhemeria, his base, and several other neighboring villages. In the previous lecture, I argued that when we encounter him, he was probably not a slave, as has usually been thought, but perhaps more likely a freedman. Gamelus's handwriting is well attested and not very attractive, but it has been more challenging to identify that that of Epagathus, because what we have is his archive, composed largely of incoming correspondence. Still, it is not impossible. Giuseppina Azzarello has devoted an article to doing just this, beginning with his subscription in P. Fay 91. You can see that down here and moving on to see the same hand in three other texts. Despite some variation in the style of writing, her minute analysis teased out distinctive combinations of features that could be seen as his. From this basis, she moved to identifying P. Laurentiana, 39, as a letter of Agathus to Gamellus. Both the body and the greetings are his, she thinks, just written in different styles as is appropriate. Even more interesting, she identifies a Homeric role with writing exercises as being in Epagathus's hand. <clears throat> he thus belongs to that group of managers whose education went beyond elementary to include a real interest in literature. What is harder to pin down at this point is Epagathus's daily activities, in part because so much of the archive remains unpublished. But they probably did not differ greatly from what we have seen on other estates. Gamellus had extensive olive, olive cultivations and oil production, with an oil press being part of the estate. Much of the labor required was hired in on a temporary basis at the time of the harvest and processing. And no doubt, Epagathus spent much of his time managing this workforce, which amounted to something like 1,400 person days per year. <clears throat> the 
The archive of the descendants of Patron forms part of the complex assemblage of documents found in the basement level of a house in Temtunis. It was at first, and for a long time, called the Archive of Lacase by the editors, based on a reference to Lacase as father in the openings of several letters of Patron to him. But it was recognized by Clarissa and Galazzi that father is a term of respect rather than of family relationship. Lacase was in fact a frontistes, working for members of the family rather than its patriarch. The archives called those of the descendants of Pecabcus, of Cronion, and of Turbo also come from this find or adjacent spaces. And Ruben Smolders has made a good case that all of them except probably Cronion are connected in the person of Turbo, who was a grandson of Pecabcus <coughs> and served as a frontistes for the descendants of Patron, or at least for some of them. Attempts to connect the archive of Cronion with Turbo have so far not succeeded, although, in fact, Cronion is his patronymic. The study of this archive remains inadequate. It was the subject of my wife's dissertation in 1974, <coughs> based only on the first four volumes of the Milan Papyri, before the later installments of the archive were published. And it is discussed at some length by Kehoe in his book, as well as by Smolders in the Trismegistos accounts of the three archives in question. But the absence for almost all of the texts in the archive of either a usable plate in the edition or a publicly available digital photograph of the papyrus has constituted a serious obstacle to studying the hands of the archive, about which there are only a few cursory remarks in the editions. But it seems likely, as Smolders has argued, that all of these texts were in the possession of Turbo and deposited by him in the so-called cantina. Fortunately, when I started to sort this out, I had a nearly complete set of photos from 50 years ago of the relevant text in the four, first four volumes. And Galazzi did send me some color images, which I will show you of the ones that were most relevant. Turbo's family was based in Tebtunis, which was also the center of the extensive holdings of the Patronids, and possibly also the family's home before moving to Arsinoe around 130. These holdings amounted to more than 500 ruras, according to the estimate of Daniele Foroboski who counted up 161 plots of land mentioned in their archive, <coughs> for many of which we do not know the size. The very dispersed character of the estate posed a significant challenge for management, as Kehoe has observed, and much of it was leased out. The opportunities for economies of scale that the direct exploitation of a more consolidated estate would have offered were largely absent. But the larger properties did include uh, and demand more investment in facilities, including wells and a mill. The accounts suggest that central management of human and animal labor was a critical component of management along with handling the leasing. The estate certainly used managers from an early time. A prostates named Sonsnaus is mentioned already in 109, and Lacase himself was, as I have mentioned, a manager, probably even before that date. We do not know <coughs> whether his title was Prostates, Frontistes, or something else. Turbo himself first appears in the archive in 154 with his brother Onophorus, borrowing money from Heron, also called Serapion, son of Amatias. Twelve years later, he leased land from Heron. By that time, he was already frontistes. In 163, he appears as frontistes in an account belonging to Heron's cousin Ptolarion I. The, 
The intertwining of transactional and employee relationships in the same person was already signaled by Forabowski, pointing to the case of Nicarion, daughter of Dorion as well, which is of particular interest as being that of a woman. Something so shocking that the editors misread the name as masculine in volumes two and three of the series. She receives barley for beer making in several accounts, large amounts of bread in another, pays money in the city in another, and is the lessee in four leases, all of which she subscribes in her own hand, asserting her right to sublease. It seems very possible that the property owners may have chosen managers from among those with whom they had sufficient transactional experience to know their reliability and other relevant skills. It is also possible that the relationship may have developed gradually rather than switching all at once from one to the other. Uh, Turbo's hand is available in only four papyri that have publicly available illustrations, but I have a few more that I can show as well. <coughs> the first is an account of barley that explicitly identifies itself as through Turbo. The second is an application for lease of land addressed Tolarion, son of Tolarion, dated to 170. You can do it. There, um, there is no internal indication of who wrote this, but the hand is similar to that of the account, and in my view, identical, as indeed Mariangela Vandoni asserted. It is a well-formed, regular, and attractive hand, with some ligatures, but not fully cursive. Somewhat more cursive in the lease than in the account. One might also take under consideration the two accounts, P. Mill Vogliano 303 and 304, but although these refer to Turbo in their entries and belong to his period of service, they are not evidently produced by him, and neither is in the same hand as the other two possible instances that I have just shown. When Vandoni tells us that <coughs> P. Mill Vogliano 130 to 142 are all in the same hand as these two documents that I've just described as being in Turbo's hand, we may well believe that he wrote many such contracts. And it is very easy to see the identity of the hand in 130, 132, 133, and 140. I believe we're, oh, there we go. It's 130 and 132. These are all well preserved, fortunately. Some of the others are less clear, but it is clear that indeed Turbo wrote many, if not all, of the leases from this period. Hmm. There we go. Those who were here for the second lecture and noted the emphasis on training in geometry that figures in the mathematical codex that Alexander Jones and I edited, <coughs> may by this point be wondering why they are not hearing more about geometry in the daily activities of managers. What was the point of learning all those formulas? The largest part of the answer probably comes from the way in which the papyri have come to us. Whether it be land area, the volume of earth to be excavated from a canal, or the number of bricks needed for a granary, these calculations will have taken place in rural locations and almost certainly been discarded once done. The results would be recorded and used, but the computation had no value in the archive of a frontistes. Nor would the discarded writing materials have been sent to a central office from which they might wind up on an urban dump, where they might have survived to be discovered. When we find bricks being ordered or shipped or the digging of a ditch requested, we may be sure that those calculations had been done. 
By chance, however, we do have a bit of evidence for this type of calculation. Probably few of you have ever read deeply enough into the volume of the Bodleian Ostraca to have come upon numbers 1847 to 1857, let alone tried to figure out what their cryptic and off-putting notation means. Fortunately, a few scholars have done so. Most usefully, David Fowler described how these texts worked. They give measurements in Scoinia, which would have been familiar to students of the kind of geometry found in our codex, or students of metrological tables in the codex for the four sides of a field. They are arranged on the sherd a bit curiously to our eyes, but not illogically. If we treat a rectangle somewhat arbitrarily as having a top, a bottom, left, and right sides, the writer gives first to the top, then one of the sides below a line, and then the other side is if B and D the, were numerator and denominator, which is not actually the case. And after that, back at line level gives the bottom. The method used is exactly that of the codex, adding each pair of parallel or more or less parallel sides together, taking the average and then multiplying them together to get the area. As the Arura was one square scoinion, the arithmetic was not unduly challenging except for the use of fractions, which are of course far from easy to manipulate. <coughs> Fowler points out that the use of this simplifying formula will, in all cases where the field is not actually rectangular, give an answer slightly larger than the real size. In the cases where it was those drawing up the tax registers who did the calculations, as Fowler assumes, this will mean that the taxes will be slightly higher than the correct number. It is unlikely that most taxpayers have the geometric skills to challenge the estimate. In the case of rent on private land, however, leases virtually always give approximate sizes in any event, often with a phrase like, or however many they may be, to protect the landlord if the canny peasant should measure the plot and decide that it was actually not quite as large as stated. But the central point here is that geometry was indeed useful in the toolkit of managers in both the public and the private spheres. And the formulas found in the educational codex agree with the practice that we find in these ostraca. <coughs> For many managers, this kind of computation would not form part of their daily practice, of course. But for some, it would be important. Egyptian fields do, in fact, tend to be about as rectangular as the landscape allows, and it is not difficult to imagine the need for such calculations. I believe it was two days after that photo was taken when I was up in a balloon with Bruno and Paola that a balloon at Luxor uh, caught fire and crashed. Um, I'm probably not going in one of those again. <clears throat> As we come toward the end of our time, I want to reiterate the point that I made last week. There is a strongly Roman character to much of what we have found in the naming and structuring of managers. It would therefore be interesting to pursue in more detail a comparison of what we've found with the patterns of use elsewhere in the Roman Empire. Jean-Jacques Aubert's 1994 monograph, to which I referred in the first lecture, has a single page devoted to business managers in the papyri. In it, he asserts that a systematic study of the role of private managers in the papyri would undoubtedly yield interesting results leading to a more thorough understanding of the economic importance and relative social status of various types of business agents in the Roman world. On this basis, he went on to conclude, a superficial survey of the papyrological evidence shows that the reality is not so clear cut as modern historians would hope. 
and warns against any attempt at establishing universal standardized patterns in which institutions of private law would have to fit. Both statements are true, but I think that even the superficial survey in this lecture points both to a considerable degree of adoption of Roman concepts of management and yet a very incomplete Romanization of these institutions. Neither slave managers nor formal adoption of Roman concepts of legal representation seem to be visible. Before coming back to some other aspects of management in Egypt, let us take a look at a central element in Aubert's book, although he did not frame it in quite these terms, and how it looks from an Egyptian perspective. In his massive study of communication by way of letters, <coughs> Patrick Reinard brings into the discussion the complexities of principal agent theory. That is the question at the broadest level of how differences and in interests between principals and agents affect their dealings with one another and with others. A common contemporary example about which much has been written is the ways in which modern corporations have struggled to align the interests of owners, that is shareholders, and management. The large and complex grants of shares of stock to executives are part of the not always successful attempt to give managers a stronger interest in the long-term well-being of the company, not low only in its short-term performance. Reinhard presents a number of examples of potential issues in the relationships that we see in papyrus letters. If I write to you with information about current prices, for example, Will I use that information to do what is in your interests, or will I use it to my own advantage and leave you in a worse situation? Most of his discussion focuses on what seem to be more equal relationships rather than the hierarchical ones of employer and employee or master and servant. But these two can raise such issues. There is no simple description or solution to such matters. Much depends on the relationship between the individuals. To a large degree, the employer has little way of influencing the employee, except as a last resort by firing him. That, however, is an expensive remedy, given the difficulty of finding trustworthy agents. Papyrus letters between employer and employee contain enough complaints about the failure of agents to carry out the instructions they have been given to make it clear that employers did not, in fact, fire their staff very readily. <coughs> the legal relationship between principal and agent in Roman law is discussed at length by Aubert. Its history is immensely complicated and cannot be described here in any detail. Roman law originally did not permit direct agency. That is, broadly speaking, no one other than the two contracting parties could create a legal obligation for either of them. The potentially crippling effects of this restriction for the development of both land management and commerce were handled over the centuries by a variety of means. Sons who were under patria potestas and slaves were regarded as legally part of the father or owner and could act for him with his authorization. Slave agents remained central to Roman management over a long period, both with broader competence as procuratores and with more specific responsibilities, institores. Over time, remedies were devised and extended to allow freedmen and even salaried freeborn persons to serve in such capacities. It is difficult to describe the exact state of things at the time of the Roman conquest of Egypt. And of course, the broad application of Roman law in Egypt did not come about at the time of the conquest. That is a famously complex issue. We should, I think, suppose that Roman concepts of agency and management arrived with them, but not the technical niceties of the law, particularly as it relates to formulary procedure. 
In particular, there is little sign that the Roman preference for servile agents took hold in Egypt. Even though the master's power over a slave obviously affects the relationship of principal and agent very substantially. But the game theoretical approach to principal agent relationship strikes me as simple minded in any case. The entire concept rests on a concept of human nature embedded in the model of Homo economicus <coughs> in neoclassical <coughs> economics, in which selfish interest is the main or only driver of human behavior. Although this concept is not without its uses for analytic purposes, there is a strong current of contemporary thought <coughs> emerging from evolutionary biology that sees it as excessively reductive and indeed mostly wrong. Evolution has made us into a social species in this view with strong affective bonds and a real interest in the well-being of others. Principal agent theory, which rests almost entirely on a neoclassical foundation, needs to be rethought in the light of these developments. Its more game theoretical side may need to be abandoned altogether. Let me now summarize five characteristics of management in Roman Egypt that seem central to understanding it. First, for the most part, there is little obvious differentiation or specialization of roles. At the lower end, a chief shepherd obviously had expertise that made him right for his position. But most managerial positions involved a fairly limited and common range of skills. Second, positions were, however, distinguished by hierarchy. Even if the skills involved did not differ very much, the level of responsibility did. There are some signs of mobility among levels, as with Herodotus moving from being a transport manager to serving as a frontistes. But the hierarchy tended to reflect existing social and economic structures. The practice of having top management in the larger estates in the hands of members of the civic elite turns out not to be peculiar to the Appianus estate, but to turn up repeatedly in different times and places. Third, managers were mostly men. But there is slight evidence for female participation in estate management and much more information about women managing family businesses. These, however, were perhaps better seen as entrepreneurs rather than as paid managers. Fourth, there's little indication of the use of slaves as managers in the papyri, despite the claims that have sometimes been made. And fifth, the entire system shows a complex balancing of the need for professional experience and expertise with the amateurism favored by ancient upper class ideology. How do these core characteristics find a reflection in the written culture of late antiquity and at the same time have an impact on that written culture? First, there is an obvious congruence between the social hierarchy of management and the tiers of the educational system. It was above all the children of the civic elite who would have had the literary education that at least in ancient eyes fitted them for leadership. That leadership involved management of people, but also self-expression in various forms, particularly letters, a form used for a considerable variety of functions. Persuasion through language was at the core of their activity. That does not mean they were not practical people with a good knowledge of operational detail. <clears throat> Even at the level of grandees like Appianus, precisely that kind of eye for specifics and nearly obsessive drive to get them right can be seen. But their educations will always have focused on language. The level below them will have had lesser versions of the same education. 
At the same time, we can see that in the Roman period and even more in late antiquity, there came to be additional types of education aimed at teaching more specific technical skills that would be useful to that second level. The mathematical codex and other texts of its type show that geometry, measurement, and drafting of legal agreements of all sorts formed the core of this education. Amateurism was not enough when it came to documenting the assets and liabilities of an estate, whether that was sums owed to the landlord by a tenant or a borrower or the size of a piece of land. This professional education marks a recognition that with the growth in the size, complexity, and investment requirements of the estates of the wealthy, more expertise was needed to make them profitable and allow the owners themselves to continue to be the informed and active amateurs that they needed to be in order to serve their public functions. Third, this divided approach to management had as a side effect, perhaps from the elite point of view, a side benefit of avoiding any need for management to become a learned profession. Modern Western society has generally recognized medicine, law, and theology, i.e. the clergy, as the three learned professions. In the last century, the increased specialization and professionalization of the academic world has made us into the fourth. We are at no great distance from late antiquity in this respect, at least for the first three professions. Is management a learned profession <coughs> in this sense? It certainly was not in antiquity, if only because the managers who received professional training did not come from a high enough social class to work on an equal footing with bishops, scholasticoi, and doctors. And even in modern times, business schools not only have failed, but will continue to fail, according to a historian of management thought, to become a profession in a fashion comparable to the others. The lack of professionalization is related to the absence of serious ancient discourse about management. Unlike medicine and law, management had essentially no literary culture in antiquity. Diligent attempts to discover ancient literature on the subject has, of course, found works about leadership, along with the kind of pre-economic financial thought found in works like Xenophon's Poroi or the Pseudo-Aristotelian Oikonomica, book two. But apart from public matters, such as military organization or the administration of aqueducts, not even the Romans wrote systematically about management. Indeed, pre-modern literature that might be thought of as concerning management is entirely about public administration, not the private economy. The Roman jurists do deal with economic matters, for example, prices and markets, but not management itself. Part of the reason may well be simply a lack of abstract conceptualization of management as something that public and private spheres had in common. But we may also be seeing the result of an upper class ideology that did not really see managing as an activity suitable for respectable gentlemen, even though we have seen many examples where this is precisely what the elite were doing. Did managers add value? It is not easy to measure the value of the contribution of managers to the economy and society of late Roman Egypt. We cannot establish a baseline or run experiments on alternative models. I do not, in fact, think we can make any quantitative assessment of the value added. But it appears to me that managers were indispensable for three related aspects that increasingly characterize the economy of Roman Egypt as it develops. First, the larger scale of enterprises. Above all, this means landed estates, but it also means production and export enterprises and the more professionalized imperial administration of late antiquity. These were not possible without managers. Second, 
along with this increasing scale, as Christelle Fru has observed, went a growth in the use of workers' paid salaries or wages, both as part-time labor and as permanent staff. People needed to be managed. And increasing scale meant investment of capital. The ancients may have lacked modern abstractions for economic functions, but they did not invest money without expecting a return. And economic returns don't happen without management. Investors need managers. In view of these requirements of the Roman economy, one can say that the managers made possible both economic growth and the concentration of wealth, two phenomena the relationship of which has been the matter of much recent debate. Inequality, in other words, required managers. The expansion of written culture and education to embrace geometry problems, however badly done, and model contracts, thus played its role in making possible what might be called, with all due apologies, Roman capitalism with Greco-Egyptian characteristics. Thank you. <laughs>